Uh, with your permission, we will start the session. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, good evening, everybody, and uh, we welcome you to the next session of our Friday Fundamental, which is an ongoing series we have been conducting for more than two years now, wherein uh, speakers from uh, across uh, functions and uh, across the spectrum, uh, in national, international, uh, all eminent speakers have been coming and disseminating knowledge and experience uh, with our members for the benefit, uh, sometimes a personal benefit, sometimes it is organizational benefit. And uh, today's session is definitely, I am sure that everybody who is attending or later on will see the video will definitely take the, uh, the take home messages will be very, very strong because um, uh, today's speaker, Mr. Uh, Syed Ramiyar Balsara, uh, is, uh, is an expert in the area of personal finance. And as he says that managing personal finance is important for anybody, especially in today's tumultuous world. Uh, and also, I'm sure with today's uh, session, we will take home the knowledge on personal taxation, investments, and interest. Um, and uh, uh, taking the privilege of introducing Mr. Balsara to the audience. Mr. Balsara has more than 35 years of experience in the industry, of which 31 years are spent in one organization, which is the most iconic organization of the uh, country, Larson and Tubro. He retired in March 2021 as the head of Shared Services Center in Mumbai, looking after all the employee-related uh, payouts and retirement benefits, which I think is a, is a, a very rich experience in terms of personal finance. Uh, he's extremely passionate about teaching in the areas of accounts and finance, profits and loss accounts, capital budgeting, value drivers, source of funds, bank guarantees, risk management. For personal finance and investments, personal taxation, union budget, total quality management, and corporate sustainability. He has been teaching for the last uh, 21 years uh, in companies like l and and other corporates and at educational institutions uh, across the country. He has conducted over 300 personal uh, programs on personal finance and about 150 programs on finance for non-finance uh, covering topics mentioned in above. Because you may be in any department in the company, but finance is such where the exposure will always help. And it is always beneficial for the organization if the employees focus on the uh, on uh, on prudence, I will say. He is a certified trainer under the National Skill Development uh, Corporation's Skills India mission and has taught approximately 16,000 employees of l &T group. It's a, it's a tremendous achievement, Mr. Balsara. Thank we are you, proud of it. And about 500 employees in other companies. His highly, practical, his highly practical style of teaching on account of practical job experience of 35 years in various areas of accounts like vendors, accounting, account finalization, comfortable with uh, classroom and online modes of teaching. He's comfortable in teaching personal finance to blue-collared employees in, in the local languages of uh, Hindi, Marathi, or Gujarati uh, with the English translation, of course. So, Mr. Valsara, we welcome you to the group and we are highly thankful to you and honored to have you in the session. All is yours, sir. We look Thank you so much, you. sir. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much, sir. And I'll start with the presentation. And thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me. I'm sure the glorious introduction by Mr. Sharma has raised some expectations in each one of you. At this moment, I do not know whether those expectations can be fulfilled by me, but I'll definitely try my level best to do so. Now, the subject is such that given the time frame that we have of about an hour and a half, including the question and answers, it would not be possible to cover everything in the subject. In fact, even if I speak to you for probably one and a half days, 
I would in all probability not be able to speak about everything that needs to be spoken about. So then why are we here? What is our objective for today's presentation? Our objective for today's presentation is at the end of this one and a half hours, when we go back to our lives, we know a little more about the subject than what we do right now, a little more. Going on the assumption that we know nothing about the subject, I have kept the presentation at the very basic level. Therefore, for those of you who have had some interaction with personal finance before, and all of you would have, there may be some portions of the presentation which you are already familiar with. At such times, in the interest of the entire group, I would request you to bear with me. Now, as it was mentioned, our objective here is to learn something about personal finance. And how are we going to do that? We have an agenda which I'd like to share with you. Our agenda basically for today is, we'll first talk about the seven golden rules of personal finance. We'll then move on to two topics which we don't like to talking much about, but topics which are important. That is the rather intimidating topic of personal income tax. And then move on to another topic called expenditure monitoring. These people say are very boring topics because people tell me which share should I buy that will double in three months or which investment is safe and things like that. We'll definitely move on to investments. But before that, what we'll do is we'll just go through a subject that we all learned many years ago in our eighth standard in arithmetic, the interesting subject of interest. We look at interest, not from the examination point of view, we all know what is interest, but we'll have a relook at it from the practical experience of life. And in the course of this interest and investments, where we'll cover all the investments, we'll answer that fundamental question, which people often ask me. And for a very, I used to, I've been teaching now for the last 35 years, but it's only in the last 10 years have I been able to answer this very fundamental question of life that how much is enough? Finally, if you don't want this animal called money to bother you for your personal life, how much money is finally enough? There are two theories in that which we'll look at. So just some requests. We will have a question and answer session after the session, but please put your questions in the box. I'll definitely try all your questions, I'll answer them. The other thing is that not only is this session being recorded, but I will be personally available to you, the owner of this and the maker of these slides, not only the slides will be available, but the creator of those slides, I will be sharing at the end of the presentation, my mobile number and my email ID, because as I see it, each call or each interaction is an opportunity for me to learn on this never ending subject. So let's start with the seven golden rules. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. The first of these golden rules is wealth management is important. You know, the unfortunate part is people who say that money doesn't matter are those who have made the first 100, 200 crores and money doesn't matter to them at all. Or you have this particular brand of people who are the so-called godmen who talk about things that money is not important, but if you see the lifestyles that they lead, it's better than any business tycoon living. The other thing is that wealth management or money management or personal finance, all this is the same thing, is not as difficult as it is made out to be. We have learned far more difficult things in life, all the trigonometry we learned, all the derivatives, all the integration that we learned, all the dates that we remember in history are much more difficult. And these are such, just some simple things which I would like you to learn, not by heart, but by head. And I promise you it's not difficult. You must be wondering, what is this one golden rule? The first golden rule in the world of personal finance is there is no golden rule. Nothing is permanent in the world of personal finance. Like it is said in the Bhagavad Gita, parivartan hi sansar ka niyam hai. Or as Confucius has said, the only thing constant about life is change. Similarly, 
The first golden rule in the world of personal finance is that there is no golden rule. People often ask me a question, Balsara Ji, which is the best investment? Now, if that was such a simple question to answer, and if there was one straight jacketed answer, then we wouldn't need all these lectures. The truth is that there is nothing like one golden rule. There's nothing like one best investment. You have to mix and match. People often ask me which share is going to go up. Now, if anyone and all of us knew the answer to this, then life wouldn't be so difficult, isn't it? So let's go on to the next rule. If you look at the first basic equation of personal finance, it's income minus expense is equal to saving. And savings will lead to investments, which are in various kinds in the stock market or safe investment, government securities, which we'll cover towards the ending of the presentation. But if you understand, and if you understand the whole philosophy of life, please understand and appreciate that all of us would like to earn a few lakhs every month or a few crores every month if possible. But that is not determined by us. That is determined by circumstances external to us. Against this, if you look at the other palu or the other aspect of finance, that is the expenditure part, it's a little more under your control. Agree, very often in life for middle-class people, even the expenditure is not in control. You have aged parents to look after, medical expenses can kill you. You have children to be sent abroad for their studies. All this can kill you. But at the end of the day, if you look at these two parts of your personal finance equation, that is income minus expenditure, the first saving is saving, the first equation of personal finance, there's a little more control on the expenditure side. The next point is any, expense, any income tax that you pay is money which is lost forever. Now, please don't misunderstand me, ladies and gentlemen, but I am not in the least trying to suggest to you that you should not be paying your taxes honestly. Please pay every single pesa of your income tax honestly. But I was fortunate to do a portion of my chartered accountancy under India's greatest lawyer, a gentleman who definitely some of you with gray hair will definitely remember his name, a gentleman by the name of Shri Nani Palkiwala. And as young chartered accountant students, Palkiwala Saab used to always tell us, ladies and gentlemen, please remember the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. Tax avoidance, staying within the law, you can minimize and possibly eliminate income tax. You would be surprised to hear this, but up to seven and a half, eight lakhs, or if you take a housing loan, even up to 10 lakhs, you need not bother about this animal called income tax. You need not pay any money towards income tax and staying within the law. Our money should outlive us. Now, if you look at the average life expectancy of Indians, thanks to the tremendous advances in medical science, on an average, the average life expectancy is going up by about five years every decade. Now, what does this mean? This means, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you in your 30s and your 40s, you can, and I'm not joking, you can reasonably expect to live till you are a hundred years. Now, what does this mean? This means that maybe at that time, retirement ages might be beyond 60, they might be even 70. But still that means you have a good 20, 25 years or 30 years of expenditure when there is no salary income. And it's at this time that when your investment income is going to be your main income is what you are bothered about. So we must understand that the earlier you start preparing for this, and this cycle isn't going to change, you might not live for 100 years, but you will definitely reach 90, 95 years. You will definitely retire by the time you're 60 or 65, which means 25, 30 years. And it's a myth to think that post-retirement, your expenses come down. Because the last golden rule, and probably the most important one is, whether you like it or not, ladies and gentlemen, inflation kills. If you look at this, inflation kills. I'll just take you back to see these three classes of society. There is this rich guy on the left-hand side of the slides, as you can see them. He's comfortably protected from the price level. He's got a very decent size umbrella. He's even got a life jacket. And even his shoes are not wet. The poor guy is barely with his nose above the water. And 
the duvida or the dharam sankat that middle class people like us face is that you very often don't know which side you're looking at if you make a good increment you get a good legacy or you inherit something you're looking at the right hand side and saying i'm on my way there but very often you're looking at the other side and wondering at the left hand side and wondering whether i am very much better than that guy down there in the water so just to recap the seven golden rules wealth management is important it is not as difficult as it is made out to be the one golden rule is that there is no golden rule your expenditure is more under your control than your income avoid and try to minimize tax remember that you are going to be living for 20 30 years beyond retirement when there is no salary income and the last golden rule is inflation kills this is again some numbers now why am i talking about these numbers because this gives you some idea of what is the average spend and if you look at this expensive city of mumbai i have stayed all my 62 years in mumbai you do find that on an average today a family of four would to live a proper middle class i'm not saying an extravagant life you would find that they would need at least about 10 lakh rupees a year which is about 80000 rupees a month also when we come to expenditure monitoring please understand that there is no one kind of formula fit all because i when i talk to our workers in marathi they tell me that sahib 25000 madhi pan ghar chalta which means that our house runs in 25000 and i have some friends who spend probably more than 5 to 10 lakh rupees every month because that is their lifestyle but having a importance or having a control on this number does go a long way to have some control over this animal called money so this was the opening remarks of the presentation as i told you i'll take questions at the end and this is not really money or it's not really anything to do with personal finance but more with common sense so let's move on to the first topic and a topic which unnecessarily intimidates us the topic of personal income tax now a lot of people have said a lot of interesting things about personal income tax like people say that income tax payment is when the rich person send their money to swiss bank accounts and the middle class person send their money to delhi and tax should be collected like the honey bee collects honey but probably the best statement i have heard on tax is what my guru taught me that beyond what nani palkewala saab used to say was that beyond all the taxes there should be one tax called the prevention of cruelty to taxpayers act and especially for the salaried person income tax in this country is extremely and extremely unfair for the simple reason that a salaried person pays income tax on whatever he gets by whatever name called whereas a company or a businessman or a partnership they pay they pay taxes only on profits so the salaried person has very little object very little things by which he can reduce his tax we'll see that in the next in the slide after the next slide so let's look at income tax with as you have five fingers on your hand or you have the five pandavas similarly income under the indian income tax act is computed under five heads that is income from salary which arises because of an employer employee relationship it also means any pension that you get from your employer after retirement now why is the salary income important because you get a separate deduction or some separate deductions which we will see in the next slide when it comes to salary income the second house is income from house property which is a residential house property fortunately about 4 5 years ago piyush goel increased the number of houses which are free from income tax to 1 to 2 otherwise previously the rule was that if you had a second house anywhere in the world and even if that house was vacant you would have to show the notional rent that house earned today fortunately it's extended to the third house so if you are fortunate in life to have a third house please appreciate that it might be lying vacant the whole year you might not be actually earning any rent from it but you have to show the notional rent how do you calculate the notional rent it's taken as what the neighboring flat would earn each district each taluka each place has what is called as a notional value for income tax purposes the third head is the residual head that is income from other sources we surprisingly don't have a separate head called interest interest comes under this head 
it's in some views the most dangerous head because the section says when in the opinion of the income tax officer there is reasonable doubt to believe that this is income he may choose to do so so you have to prove that it is not income so this is the residual head which brings us to the fourth head which is income from capital gains these are the profits that you make only on the profits essentially two kinds when you sell a residential building or you sell a residential home depending on how long you have held the home you can get a uh, indexation to the value at which you have bought it the index for the purchase in the year 2001 to is 100 and the current year's index is 331 so basically whatever price you have bought it you are allowed say you bought a house for 10 lakhs you can increase the cost to 33 lakhs 10000 and the capital gains are payable at the selling price minus the index cost of the house you have to pay tax at 20% or you have to invest in a new property within 2 years or you can invest up to 50 lakhs in particular bonds which cannot be sold for 5 years the other kind of capital gains is when you sell shares the shares have to be held for more than a year when you sell the shares if you have bought them before 31st january 2018 the closing price on 31st january 2018 is considered the acquisition price and the price at which you sell them minus the price as on 31st january 2018 is treated as the capital gains there is no benefit of indexation unlike property and the difference the first 1 lakh is exempt the rest is chargeable to tax the last head is income from business or profession now one thing which is very convenient for a business or professional person is there is a section of the indian income tax which by default on a presumptive basis allows you to take an exemption of 50% of whatever that income is up to 50 lakh rupees which means say you are working somewhere as a consultant you are not on the rolls you get say let us say 4 lakh rupees a month which means you have got 48 lakhs you can without any books of accounts without any bills without any supporting or any books of accounts you can claim 24 lakhs as an exempt in income you don't get any other deductions and you pay tax only on that 24 lakhs this is your income from business or profession now each of these heads has a specific deduction which we'll come to in the next slide the only reason why i wanted to show you this slide was that there are five heads of income today in income tax you have an option a and an option b because this lecture is short this is normally a 3 hour lecture i won't get into the benefits of both of them but just take it for you can discuss with me after the lecture or give me a call or send me an email the way the law is structured at the moment please forget about option b option b doesn't help if you are a salaried person and you have chosen option b please get back to option a where you get the deductions and a slightly higher rate of tax the maximum the benefit that you can get if you are claiming today a deduction more than 2 and 1/2 lakhs which i will explain in the next slide option a is beneficial and let's forget about option b what i am afraid of is i don't know how long this all these deductions that you get which we will see in the next slide we'll come to so let's without wasting more time come to the summary of income tax and this is a sheet which i think all of us should know the annual salary is your gross salary say you are getting a, a salary of 1 lakh rupees a month you have 1 lakh into 12 which is 12 lakhs you need to add if it's company housing it's a uh, income tax wise it's not a very practical perquisite because 15% of your salary is added as a housing perquisite please understand that the housing perquisite is a function of the salary not of the house so it's not very friendly from the income tax point of view on the other hand getting a company car and the company owns the car is an excellent perquisite because all that gets added to your taxable income is 21600 rupees per year which means even if you are in the 30% tax bracket the tax that you pay for that car additional tax that you pay is only 6300 rupees 21000 600 into 30% you get certain allowances exempt which is hra lta and the children's education allowance not much unfortunately but 100 rupees per month per child 
subject to a maximum of two of two children. So nothing great, but HRA, how can you claim the exemption? By actually paying the rent, the conditions for HRA exemption are that the rent paid has to exceed 10% of the salary. The HRA can't exceed 50% of the basic salary. And of course, the deduction can't be more than the actual HRA you're getting. Similarly, you can take your family for a holiday, not every year, but once in two calendar years or twice in a block of four calendar years. And whatever you get as LTA, you can claim it as a tax-free amount. Fortunately for items number four and five, unlike items number three, where you need to give supportings, in four and five, you don't need any supportings. You automatically get these deductions. This is the contribution we make every month to profession tax. That is 200 rupees every month and 300 rupees in the month of February. And a flat deduction of 50,000 rupees for standard deduction, irrespective of what is your salary. So when we come to salary, it's one plus two, that is the perquisites, minus three, minus four, minus five. To the salary income, the only exempt income today in India is the income, in, uh, the interest you get on your provident fund, which has also been amended two years back. The contribution that you make up to two and a half lakh rupees, the interest on that is tax free. Whatever contribution is made beyond two and a half lakhs, the interest on PF that you get is taxable. And the contribution that you do on your PPF, one and a half lakh rupees per year, the interest on that is exempt. Company dividend is also taxable. And unfortunately, unlike as in the past where it was tax free up to 10 lakhs, today it starts from zero. And so what can we reduce? The only thing that is really available for a reduction for a salaried person is, if you take a housing loan, the interest that you pay on the housing loan, housing loan is a loan where the interest and the principal, the principal you will get a deduction under ATC. You get both of these as a deduction. The maximum loss from house property, that is the loan interest that you can show is two lakhs. Now in two lakhs, how much loan can you take? If you take housing loan interest at about 30 at 7%, you can probably take 30 lakhs. That won't help you much in a city like Mumbai. But if it's a husband and a wife, and both of them are taxpayers, then both of them can take 30 lakhs, 30 lakhs, pay the loan jointly, and both of them can claim the deduction up to 2 lakh rupees from their salary. 6 plus 7, which what have I done to the salary income? I have added the other incomes. I get my total income. From this, I get my deductions. Now, ATC is a great deduction because you can cover expenses like tuition fees for your kids' education, life insurance premium. You can pay to the private life insurer also, and you get a deduction. The housing loan principal, remember you got the interest. That is what I showed you in 7C. You also get the principal or investments like PF, PPF, other investments. There are some 50 categories in this. I've just listed down what I felt were the major categories. If you're somebody who likes to put money into the stock market and you want this deduction of ATC, you have to choose the equity linked savings scheme or you have to choose exchange traded funds of CPSUs. Now, most of us know this, so I won't dwell much on this. The deduction is the actual amount invested. There are no individual limits. Cumulatively, this is 150,000 and a separate deduction of 50,000 for NPS, which some of you might not know, which is why I put it in bold. So what is the maximum deduction you can get on this? There is slide separately for PPF and NPS. So we'll talk about those investments at that time. This is only from the tax point of view. So two lakhs here, then the medical insurance premium. If you're below 60, you're a non-senior citizen. So you get 25,000 rupees. If you cover a senior citizen, then the additional deduction is 50,000 rupees. If you're paying the premium for someone who's more than 60 years old, education loan, there is no limit. You can get the, but it's only the interest. You don't get a deduction for the principal. This is available for eight years without any monetary cap. Similarly, and an interesting deduction, we are one of the few countries in the world which encourage people to purchase electrical vehicles. If you take a loan for purchasing an electrical vehicle, including an electric scooter, the interest that you pay on that loan up to 1,50,000, you can get a deduction. The actual interest paid or 1,50,000, whichever is less. And qualified donations, 
qualified donations two categories anything that is paid to pradhan mantri or indira gandhi jawaharlal nehru etc which is usually a government scheme is 100% or if it is some religious or it is an ngo some ngos of course are covered by 100% but you get a 50% deduction and another interesting deduction which is if it's divided into two categories for seniors and for non seniors if you are less than 60 years the deduction you get is under section 80 tta where it is 10000 rupees on the savings bank account interest only which means you'll have to include that savings bank account interest which you get twice a year in that 7a column or if you are a senior citizen you can't take both a senior citizen takes 80 ttb a non senior citizen or someone who's less than 60 takes 80 tta for a senior citizen the limit is enhanced to 50000 and the category of invest also covers things like postal deposits or senior citizen schemes etc but for someone who's less than 60 it's 10000 and it's only the savings bank account so we have gone fairly systematically if you see to try and eliminate this fear of income tax 1 plus 2 Minus three, minus four, minus five gives you income chargeable under the head salaries. To this, you add your other income that gives you your gross total income, and then you work out on the deductions and you take those deductions. The most important being the ATC deduction, one lakh fifty thousand plus fifty thousand exclusively for NPS and ATTTA. So this gives you your total income. Until this stage, we were going fairly systematically. and now there is a break because from 10 you straight away come to tax so how do you compute tax there is no need to be a chartered accountant to compute tax all that you need to remember is and again i am telling you don't remember the scales or the don't remember these slabs by heart think of it logically or by head how do you think of it logically the difference between 2 and 1/2 and 5 lakhs is 2 and 1/2 lakhs 5% of 2 and 1/2 lakhs is 12500 as you can see below similarly the difference between 5 lakhs and 10 lakhs is 5 lakhs 20% of 5 lakhs is 1 lakh so at 10 lakhs the tax you will pay is on the first 5 lakhs 12500 plus on the differential between 5 lakhs and 10 lakhs you will pay another 1 lakh that is another 1 lakh so at 10 lakhs you pay 1 lakh 12500 similarly if i calculate this supposing your income is 7 lakhs what is the amount of tax you will pay you will know that at 5 lakhs you are paying 12500 the difference between 5 lakhs and 7 lakhs is 2 lakhs 20% of 2 lakhs is another 40000 so 40000 plus 12500 that makes it 52500 what is the small tail that you see at the back you pay an education cess at 4% of the tax amount so if at 5 lakhs your tax amount is 12500 4% of 12500 is the education cess in other words what do you do the tax amount without the cess into 1.04 similarly at 10 lakhs if it is 1 lakh 12500 you pay 4% which makes it 4500 and at 10 lakhs you pay the income tax of 1 lakh 17000 which is 1 lakh 12500 plus 4500 so just to summarize and of course you can ask me questions or even after the lecture i will be available on the phone and through the email for those of you who joined in late gross salary add the housing perquisites the car perquisites housing is bad car is good less the allowances which are exempt that is hra lta and children's education you have to give supportings for that profession tax and standard deduction you automatically get that is income from salary to this you add your interest and other div and dividend income if you have taken a housing loan you can get a minus of 2 lakhs that gives you gross total income and then the various deductions now interestingly if your total income is less than 5 lakh rupees you don't pay any income tax so if supposing you calculate that your total income is 4 lakh 99000 your objective you don't want to pay any income tax should be that your total income at stage 10 in this computation should be below 5 lakhs so let's say you make that 4 lakh 90000 obviously you might have say an interest on the savings account so 490 plus 10 that is 5 lakhs 
you don't have money for a donation you don't have any loans etc but you will pay your medical insurance premium so that makes it 490 plus 10 5 plus 25 525 plus the 2 lakhs that you have to religiously use that makes it 725 and the 50000 deduction for any salaried person which makes it 775 so just by ensuring that you do these two deductions of 2 lakh rupees most likely in the PPF. I'm a great fan of PPF. I'll tell you why when we come to investments. When you do it in your PPF and 50,000 in NPS, you can up to 7.75 lakhs avoid income tax altogether. Supposing you can have some, you're staying in a rented property because either you will be staying in a rented property, the HRA can be made exempt or if you have your home loan, you can take a further deduction up to two lakh rupees, which means that if you have a home loan, that 775 can go up to 975, which means 80,000 rupees a month if you have a housing loan and probably 65,000 rupees a month without a housing loan where you can avoid income tax altogether. So tax is a problematic subject to teach and people don't like it. So you have to make it interesting. Now, please look at this number. At 10 lakhs, you paid one lakh seventeen thousand. This ten lakhs also is after taking deductions of nearly three and a half four lakhs. So this ten lakhs is at the net stage, which means at about thirteen fourteen lakhs, you're paying eleven lakh seventy thousand, which is barely eleven or twelve percent. Let's look at some numbers. We have come a long way since Moraji Bhai Desai. Moraji Bhai Desai was the finance minister of India in seventy one seventy two. He was a person who believed in high rates of tax. And have a look in what was the tax slab in 71, 72. If you were fortunate enough, I agree that five lakhs today and five lakhs in those days are totally different. But if you earned five lakh rupees, you paid four lakh forty five thousand and fifty rupees as income tax. And if you earned ten lakhs, you paid nine lakhs. So the taxation rate was ninety three percent and almost ninety four percent against. For most of us today, it is 50%. However, agricultural income in India is still a sacred cow and which is often misused by people. India, basically, the problem is we still have a significant economy which doesn't get recorded. So the tax GDP ratio is 10%. Palkiwala Saab had this very famous theory that the tax exemption should be linked to the inflation index. And if you go by that inflation index, the basic exemption, which is two and a half lakhs today, should be nine lakhs, and the 30% tax rate should kick in at 21 lakhs. Corporate taxes at 25% of profits is less than the 30% personal income tax. Dividend taxation is double income. And these are stats which I'm taking from the government's budget figures. So these are not my statistics. These are strategies, these are statistics from the budget figures, which tell you that in the last eight years, the number of taxpayers has gone up from three crores to six crores. But out of those three crores increase, 2.1 of them crores have been salaried employees. And the amazing stat which should bother all of us is that 2.9 crores salaried employees paid an average tax of 95,000 rupees. And more or less a similar number of businessmen and professional paid an average tax of only 36,500 rupees. I think this is a number which we all need to seriously look at and wonder why the salaried person is so heavily taxed. 25 lakhs is an outdated number, but today if you see almost 35 lakh new cars are bought every year, but only 24 lakh people declare an income more than 20, 10, 10 lakhs. A new car today costs on an average 10 lakhs. 35 new cars bought every year, but only 24 lakh people declare an income greater than 10 lakhs. And above one crore, Believe it or not, it's less than 50,000 people. There are clever lawyers who claim that when they do a heart wall replacement surgery, I won't name the person, but this is an actual case. There is this extremely expensive criminal and co corporate justice lawyer in, in Delhi who claimed uh, open heart surgery expenses of 50 lakhs as repairs to plant and machinery because he said that his heart was a part of his plant and machinery. And what he was doing when he did the heart wall surgery was repairs to plant and machinery. So Chief Justice Bobde very rightly commented that what is at the heart of the matter is that it is actually a matter of the heart. 
and I stay in Khar, is there's a suburb of Santa Cruz where there is a fantastic chatwala called Ram or Shyam chatwala who charges 80 rupees per plate of chart. Now, even we all know what goes into chart. So assume that he's making 40 rupees profit per day per plate. He sells about 600 plates a day. On a, on a holiday, he sells about 1,000 plates. He's making about 25, 30,000 rupees a day net. And if you ask him, Joshi ji, tax birthday ho, he says, saab wo kya hota hai. So this is the irony and the greatness of India, where on one hand, we have a salaried person paying an average tax of 95,000 rupees and people who are entirely outside the tax net. With this, I'll come to another topic, which let's get the rather boring topics out of the way first. I want you to look at this gentleman. This is not Donald Duck. This is Donald Duck's extremely conjuice or extremely miserly rich uncle called Uncle Scrooge. And he has this theory. So I'm not, when I'm telling you this slide, I'm not asking you to be an Uncle Scrooge because it's very easy for us to think of being an Uncle Scrooge, but I'm just telling you to monitor your expenses a little carefully. This is a boring and unglamorous topic. There are very limited coverage in books, magazines, or visual media. But at the end of the day, as we talked in the golden rules, expenditure is more under your control than income. So what is this 14-day rule? The 14-day rule is don't impulsively buy things. You have credit cards in your pocket, but those, as very often they have proved for youngsters especially, this is not so much for people who are over the hill like me, but especially for our youngsters, credit cards should not become weapons for the destruction of wealth. They should be used only for emergencies. There's another concept today, especially after the pandemic, you only live once. Now, this is financially disastrous because if you have to spend your life and you have to spend 100 years, remember, you need to track and record. Try to keep a diary. Once you keep a diary to monitor your expenses, you will understand two things will hit you, my friends. One, that what you thought you needed and what you actually need are two different numbers altogether. And secondly, even to maintain that same lifestyle, you will get something called, if you do it for two, three years, you will get something which is purely a personal concept. You won't find this in any book on finance. I call this my personal inflation index, which will tell you how much more you need each year. And you'll be surprised when you hear this, that what you will need to maintain the same lifestyle. Our lifestyles aren't going to dramatically change over the years. To maintain the same lifestyle, you will need at least 12 to 15% more every year. Now, your salary income is not going to go up by 12 to 15%. At the most, especially at certain levels, your salary income won't go up more than 6 to 8%. So this is the number that you need to control on. And with this, we really get into the interesting part of the session. That is, before we get into investments, let's get into the interesting topic of interest. So we all know what is interest. Interest is P into the rate of interest, into the principal, into the rate of interest is I. But interest arises because of this great phenomenon called the time value of money. Now, what is this time value of money? This time value of money, I'll give you a simple example. Supposing on Monday, the 5th of December, 2022, somebody gives you a check of 10,000 rupees and you don't deposit it on the bank on the next day, you deposit it on the 6th. That is the next day. You don't deposit it on 6th, you deposit it on 7th. So you delay the deposit by one day. Please appreciate that. I'll give you three questions, which you think about the answer and then I'll answer the question myself. First of all, by delaying this deposit by one day, have you lost something? Secondly, what have you lost? And the third thing is how much have you lost? By delaying this deposit by one day, my friends, you've lost one day's interest. And assume that you are not an investor in the stock market. You don't believe and you say that the stock market is casino, it's a jua, it's gambling. So you are believing in 8% provident fund. Even with 8%, which is available with absolutely safe investment today, you will get 800 rupees on 10,000 rupees. 800 rupees divided by 365 days in the year gives you two rupees a day. Ladies and gentlemen, the minute you understand that 10,000 rupees is equal to two rupees a day, 
you've understood the time value of money, you've understood the fact that work for money, but also let money work for you. Money earns money. Paisa paise ko kechta hai. Now, if throughout the world, life was so simple, then a lot of finance guys would be wondering, what do we do? So we complicate a simple thing like interest. We complicate it by simple versus compound. Let me give you a very simple and a very important rule, which unfortunately, it's only now that we have started teaching our kids. There is this rule of 72, which says that 72 divided by the number of years in which the money doubles is your effective rate of interest. So if your money is doubling in six years, your effective rate of interest is 72 divided by six, that is 12%. If the Indian economy is growing by 8%, it would take nine years, that is 72 divided by eight for the Indian economy to double. If your salary is going up by 12% every year, it would take 72 divided by 12, that is six years for the salary to double. Now, this being a ratio proportion, you can fool around with the numerator and the denominator. 72 divided by the number of years will give you the rate of interest in which the money doubles, or 72 divided by the number of years will give you the rate of interest. The more frequently you receive money, the better it is. A company comes to you and says, give me one lakh rupees, I'll give you 12,000 rupees once a year, 12% interest. Another company comes to you and says, I'll give you the same 12%, but I'll give it to you once a month, 1,000 rupees. Obviously, you'll select the second company because the quicker you receive money, the better it is. What is front-ended versus rear-ended? There is this garib Indian kisan who goes to the money lender or the margin and he says, Saab, mujhe sakt ek lakh rupay ki zarurat hai. The money lender says, I'll charge you 20%. Now, what does the money lender do? He deducts 20,000 20, rupees upfront and gives him 80,000 rupees. Please understand that the interest is not 20%, it is 25% because it is 20,000 on 80,000 rupees, which is front-ended interest. Try to avoid paying front-ended. Fortunately, banks cannot do this in India, but in the informal sector, it's usually calculated this way, which works out to effectively a much higher rate of interest. And finally, fixed versus floating. For most of us, it's generally better to be on the fixed side, both on the receivable as well as the payable side. If you are investing fixed, you're ensured that you're going to get that interest, especially for a retired person. If you are borrowing fixed on the housing loan, please understand that your EMIs won't suddenly shoot up. Your EMI might not shoot up, but the number of EMIs might shoot up. And especially in today's context where interest rates are expected to move up, it's always better to stay fixed and taxable versus tax-free except for PF and PPF, every other interest you get is taxable. So what do I want you to remember about interest? Interest arises because of the time value of money. 10,000 rupees is equal to two rupees a day. A lakh of rupees is equal to 20 rupees a day. Work for money, but also let money work for you. 72 divided by the number of years will give you the effective rate of interest, or 72 divided by the rate of interest will give you the number of years. The more frequently you earn interest, the better it is. Front-ended, avoid. Interest is paid for the cost of utilizing money. It is to be paid after the money is utilized. Try to stay fixed. And remember, except for PF and PPF, every other interest you get is taxable. We spend the next about 20 minutes looking at the various kinds of investments. This I will do in two ways. One. I will go through some theory of investments or the financial independence journey, find out where you stand, plan to become wealthy, develop good financial habits, protect your life and assets. This means insurance, but ladies and gentlemen, please remember insurance is not investment. Insurance is not investment. You can never make more than three to 4% by investing in insurance. You do need insurance if someone is dependent on your income, but invest, insurance is consumption. It's not investment. People often ask me the question, when should I start saving? How much should I start saving? I have only one simple answer. Try to save as much as possible and try to save as quickly as possible. 
and finally retire comfortably. So if you look at this, if you look at the number three, there are so many things in life which the importance of number three. You have three states of matter, you have three states of time. Similarly, investments are essentially of three kinds. Debt, which is you don't want to take any risk. You want to invest in the stock market, which is equity. And the third category is you're not sure. You don't know which way the markets are going to go. You don't know whether interest rates are going to go up or not. So you'll be liquid. That is, you try to convert your money as quickly as possible. The most liquid investment in India is gold. Now, how much you want to depends on your capacity to bear risk. One of the fundamental things that I would like to talk to you about is the difference between what I like to call bread and butter money and what is jam money. Bread and butter money, dal roti ka paisa, has to go into debt and it has to go into safe debt. Paneer ka paisa ya jam money. One of the rules internationally is that the younger you are, greater is your capacity to invest in the stock market. Obviously, a 30-year-old will have 30 years of salary income left. So his capacity to take risk is much larger than say a 62 year old like me. So the market formula across the world is 100 minus your age should be your investment in equity. Our Indian stock markets are still not as mature as the foreign markets. So I used to till a few years back, I used to talk about 80 minus your age. Today I have changed that. I'll talk to you it in the slide in the stock market slide, which is the last slide. The important thing to remember about investments, that is the bread and butter investments, which we'll cover first, is ladies and gentlemen, everything else is meaningless. Safety, safety, and safety is the most important. And some of the thumb rules that I've been talking about in safety for the last, say about the last five years is please see what interest rate you're getting. If the interest rate you're getting is less than seven and a half percent. It's probably safe. It's a government investment. Between seven and a half to 10 is probably an amber signal. And please don't invest your hard earned money into something which is giving you 10%. We have the greatest of laws in India, but the bottom line is if someone chooses not to pay back your money, there is nothing you can do to get your money back. You can go and file a case against him. 30 years down the line, you will be dead and gone. He will be dead and gone but your money is not going to come to you. You can go to the police, the police will hammer him up, put him in jail, but that is not going to get your money back. So when you invest in something, be careful with this. We come to, don't invest all your money into one time bucket. Try to adopt the concept of laddering, which is like the various steps of the ladder. Invest your money into three time buckets, a short term bucket, a medium term bucket, a short term would be say one to five years a medium term bucket, which is say five to 10 years and a long term bucket where the first investment is going to be PPF, which we'll try to try, talk about. As I told you, what about emergencies? Till we were stuck by the pandemic, I used to think that three months expenses is enough. Unfortunately today, with the pandemic not yet being gone, I'm waiting for the day when I can revert back to three months, but you do need about six months money for basic travel expenses, children expenses, any other regular medical expenses, loan installments. And this brings us to a very important question and probably the most challenging part or the most interesting part, the way of the presentation as you would like it. How much is finally enough? So there are two theories on this. One is a function of your income. So what this says is at various stages in your life, your income or what you have saved should be a function of your income. Please appreciate that 6x, that is six years annual income, is not going to be six times 1x. Because at the age of 60, when you are close to retirement, you will be earning much more than what you're earning at the age of 35 years. But this was basically a theory which is more suited to the Western concept. And it gives you a good track till probably what you need to do at various stages in your life probably 1x, 2x at various, at every five years, change the x by one, be honest to yourself. Now this theory in India might not work because remember that unlike some countries of the West where retirement, et cetera, is taken care of, medical expenses is taken care of, even food is taken care of to a large extent. In India, we don't have any social security net. So something that I am very comfortable about 
which might seem absurd to you but if you really want financial nirvana if you really don't want to bother about this animal called money all your life trust me extremely difficult but what i would like you to have is 20 years expenses at the age of 60 which means if your monthly expenses are say a lakh of rupees you need about 2.4 crores saved now i'll come to the assumptions which is why this is so difficult so this is how am i coming to this 20 years expenses if your expenses are 50000 rupees a month which is minimum say at least if not in bombay probably you need a lakh of rupees a lakh of rupees is 12 lakh rupees a, a year 20 years expenses at the age of 60 and please appreciate one thing that if you have this this impulse in you that you don't want to work till the age of 60 and you want to pursue your life or you want to do other things remember for every one year earlier you need to add one year more so if you want to retire at the age of 50 20 years expenses isn't enough what you'll probably need is 30 years expenses if you want to retire at the age of 55 what you'll need is 25 years expenses why is this theory so difficult because of the tough assumptions the assumptions are me or my spouse one of us unfortunately we can't cover both of us but one of us will live till we are 100 years old medically we are completely covered in the indian philosophy of life we leave everything behind for our loved ones our owned house we have our owned house at the age of 60 our non equity investments that is our bread and butter money our dal roti ka paisa is at zero risk it's not in some shady company which may default we don't have debentures or bonds or fixed deposits in some shady company most of our investments are in government securities the shares that we have in calculating this corpus that we need before covid i used to say that you can value those shares at 70 to 80% of the market value covid taught all of us that even good shares even permanently good shares there are certain evergreen shares of forever companies can also dip to 50% so i'd like you to be absolutely conservative and value those shares at 50% of the market value all your loans in life and all your liabilities means your children or your responsibilities in life are settled i know we don't like thinking of children as liabilities but it is very unfair on our parts and i'm using my words carefully to depend on our children to be fund our retirement children have their own responsibilities they have their own problems it's difficult for them today the, the competition that get today as i qualified as a chartered accountant i got immediately i got a job my children are both chartered accountants they they took 6 months to get a job and this theory of 100 why am i saying 20 years it's on a simple assumption 100 10 is the inflation remember that personal inflation index i talked about minus i don't think you can target more than 5% investment returns after tax because except for ppf which is the first bread and butter investment we will see i don't think you can target more than 5% after tax on any safe investment so this is like this pretty little girl trying to lift up jumbo what do you do if you have a second house if you have a second house then remember the house is not a liquid asset of course the first house is not investment it is consumption second house whatever income you are getting from that you can knock off that income from your expenses and take only the net expense progressively reduce the non performing shares as you go older in life remember your capacity to take risk in life is less and i am contradicting myself because 10 years down the line after this theory i was in 2008 which is my theory but in 2018 i had to contradict myself the third assumption of this theory was we leave everything for our kids unfortunately you can't afford to do that with the lowering of interest rates you know interest rates have fallen from 14 15% which is what good companies like lnt used to give in their fixed deposits to about 6 or 7% today so you will have to draw down on your capital post the age of 70 you can draw down on 5% of the capital post the age of 80 you can draw down on 10% of the capital so two theories one depending on the income 1x at the age of 35 and 6x at the age of i'll just go back that you don't need to remember anything by heart of your income the problem with this theory is that it probably doesn't take care of inflation so have something a function of your expenses which inflation covers for every one year that you need to do this before 60 that number increases 
the assumptions are tough but if you can meet this 20 years expenses trust me you have achieved financial nirvana so coming to the some of the practical issues before we spend the last 10 minutes in covering investments some of the practical issues no cash avoid investing in cash if investments have to be done please understand and appreciate i am an old timer you can pay your electricity bill online you can pay your telephone bill online you can pay your mobile bill online but when it comes to unless it's a very safe and secure portal i still believe that give a write out a check take a xerox copy of the check please invest in your name please understand that द कानून ये नहीं देखता किसका पैसा है कानून ये देखता है किसी के नाम पे पैसा है विच मीन्स इफ यू आर इन्वेस्टिंग इन द नेम ऑफ योर किड्स इफ दैट चाइल्ड बिकम्स मोर देन एटीन इट्स हिज मनी अवॉइड इन्वेस्टिंग इन अ सिंगल नेम बिकॉज इफ गॉड फॉर बिट समथिंग हैपन्स टू यू एंड देर इज नो ज्वाइंट होल्डर देन टेक्निकली रिमेंबर द नॉमिनेशन हैज नो लीगल वैल्यू वेर डज द नॉमिनेशन कम right at the bottom of the priority list the first priority is the joint holder so what is the rule for joint holder till you get married along with either mom or dad or in the unfortunate event that mom or dad are not there then along with some uncle or some brother or someone or someone who's bringing you up and once you get married or your kids get married please wait for a year by that time you know that the marriage is going to work out or not i see at least 10 to 15 divorce cases every month and this has become something much more common in india and along with the other emotional problems when there is more money there is a lot of more money when it comes the more the money the more the financial problems and i'm not saying only the girl the guy should do it even for the ladies when your daughter gets married at least for a year by the time you know that the marriage is going to work out try to keep investment separately that way god forbid but if there is a problem things might be a little less complicated keep a register now i'm not saying like a munshi ji keep a big red kitab all that you need to record is where have you invested how much have you invested when is the interest due when is the principal due and when will it come back keep up photocopies but keep them separately not in the same place where the original is the thumb rule is the original in the bank locker preferably a locker not on the basement but in the second or the third floor of the building because basements get flooded in this great city of mumbai and you won't get your papers back so these are some of the practical things on investments never in a single name a nomination has no legal value i'll give you a classical example of a nomination a uh, one of our workers in lnt had invested 25 lakh rupees that was practically 50% of his total life savings he had nominated his wife as the joint as he had nominated her he had not made her the joint holder but he suddenly died please understand that as per the hindu succession act the relatives now the son disputed the nomination so the son and the wife were on an equal footing and they were refusing to compromise on 12 and a half lakhs and what will the bank do in such a time the bank will say get a succession certificate or get a probate of the will there was obviously no will now getting a pro getting a succession certificate is a timely and costly affair in india so the thumb rule please have a joint holder always in your investments two investments unfortunately you cannot have a joint holder because the law does not permit that is the public provident fund and the nps which i will talk about just after i categorize these investments we just have about 10 minutes of the presentation to go so i'll categorize these investments i'll quickly go through the government schemes because at the end of this schemes there is a chart i'll go straight to the chart in the government schemes there is something called as a sovereign guarantee i am a great believer in ppf because it is the only scheme which is exempt 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 if you are in the 30% tax bracket that 7.1% that you get today in the ppf gives you equivalent to 14.49% do it by the 5th of the month please don't get defrauded by your banker who says you can't extend it you can extend it as much as you want the only thing is you have to do it in a block of 5 years my ppf account is more than 35 years old 
if you choose to re renew it in the 16th year, you can't withdraw it up to the 20th year. And personally, I think this is something that is part of your long-term bucket. It's something that you leave behind for your loved ones. You know, there are certain, I have a very rich friend, a very well-to-do financial friend. I won't name him, but he belongs to a community which, and I'm saying this without any communal, please don't misunderstand me, no offense meant, but he belongs to the Marwadi community. And he told me something which I'll remember lifelong. He said, Balsara sahab, humare Marwadi biradri mein jab bachcha bachchi ka janam hota hai na, to uske paanch din mein naam karan hota hai, दस दिन में उसका पान कार्ड और आधार कार्ड आ जाता है और पंद्रह दिन में पीपीएफ अकाउंट खुल जाता है दादा दादी या नाना नानी हर साल डेढ़ लाख रुपया डालते हैं एंड बाय दैट किड इज टाइम इज फिफ्टीन इयर्स ओल्ड व्हेन द फर्स्ट मेच्योरिटी कम्स अप दैट किड मियरली बाय द लॉ ऑफ कंपाउंडिंग विल हैव फोर्टी लैक्स इन इज पीपीएफ अकाउंट सो यू कैन ओपन अ पीपीएफ अकाउंट फॉर योर माइनर किड्स टू गिव दैम अ किक स्टार्ट इन लाइफ सिमिलरली द एन इज समथिंग विच वी डोंट लाइक but because of the additional 50000 tax benefit we have to do it one thing important which seniors would like to know is that previously there was an age limit of 60 in the last year the nps limit has been extended to 75 years the only thing is that anybody between the age of 50 to 75 above 50 years cannot have an equity exposure of more than 50% so the exposure to equity which for a long term investment is the best as i will explain to you in my share market slide which is coming up so the nps is something you must do please understand that that additional 50000 you do if you are in the 30% tax bracket is not 50000 it is 50000 minus 15000 the tax saving you get out of it so it is only 35000 you are investing if after ppf and nps you still want bread and butter investments you look at rbi bonds the advantage about bonds is if they are listed rbi bonds are not listed the advantage about rbi bonds is that it's secured it every it's a floating rate of interest which means every year every year on 1st january and 1st july the interest rate can go up and today's increasing interest scenario it's interesting to have on a fixed it's the only government security where the interest rate is floating and if interest rates are expected to go up it's probably worth putting in some money in the rbi bonds remember this is absolutely safe money when it comes to the investments we are most familiar with everyone tells us bhaiya bank deposit karo so i'll just say two things to a distinguished audience like you because everything else we know about bank deposits if it's a bank deposit it has to be and it has to be a scheduled bank how do you know whether it's a scheduled bank naam ke piche likha hota hai a scheduled bank is covered by the reserve bank of india your money is secure up to 5 lakh rupees of course you won't know when you will get the money a cooperative bank in our western part of india there are good cooperative banks which are scheduled like saraswat cooperative bank and abhyudaya cooperative bank but it cannot go into unscheduled banks that additional 1 to 2% if a scheduled bank is giving you 8% and an unscheduled bank is giving you 10% 10% sound so much more attractive but please remember ladies and gentlemen on a lakh of rupees all that you are getting additional is 2000 rupees in a scheduled bank you are getting 8000 rupees in an unscheduled bank you are getting 10000 rupees for that differential of 2000 rupees on a lakh of rupees please don't put that additional 1 lakh to risk this is bread and butter money i'll tell you what to do with your jam and money similarly if it's company fixed deposits you cannot choose a company with a rating lower than a there are three ratings which are higher than a double a and triple a there are three or four acceptable companies which have a crisil rating of triple a crisil as you know is credit rating investment society of india limited it's the most reputed rating agency with this we complete the bread and butter investments for want of time this is actually a three this is the chart that you probably need to refer to in the life for senior citizens the first two investments are great they give you and one change here i have not had the time to change it so the senior citizen saving scheme just now the rate has been enhanced to 7.6% so that's the only change it's not 7.4 i'd request you to correct it if you take a print out of this slide now let's come to the jam investments because you will have to invest in jam because bread and butter is only going to give you 6% so the first jam investment that i'm going to talk about is mutual funds please understand by law 
a mutual fund cannot guarantee you a return. Remember, some of us who are in our 60s will remember unit seem 64, where against an investment of 18 rupees, we got back six or seven rupees. A mutual fund is like any other service provider. If, the, if you're not well, you go to a doctor. If the car doesn't work, you go to a mechanic. Similarly, if you don't understand money, you go to a mutual fund provider. Depending on the risk you want to take, you have a riskometer which tells you. My personal belief is that mutual fund is jam money. There's no point into going into debt mutual funds because as debt mutual funds, as interest rates increase, as they are expected to increase, debt mutual funds lose value. The other thing about mutual funds is that a mutual fund dividend is different from a company dividend. If a company gives you dividend, it is out of the profits of the company, it is your money. In a mutual fund, what happens is, the broker tells you, Saab, ye 50 rupees ka NAV hai, 5 rupees dividend hai, aapko 10% immediately mil raha hai, do din mein. What he doesn't tell you is that the NAV dips to 45 rupees. So your capital is, it's your money which is coming back to you. Unlike that is in a company dividend. Gold is something we are all fond about. Gold is the most liquid investment. It's also a very good contrarian investment, which means the stock markets don't give you money. The interest rates are falling. But the interesting thing about gold is that it took all of 18 years from 1990 to 2007 to double. Now, when an investment takes 18 years to double, by the law of 72, we understand that the return is 72 divided by 18, which is 4% per annum. So this chart tells you the gold versus the stock market. The left-hand side is the Bombay Stock Exchange Index represented by the worm. And there is one more slide, which I'll come to later on. And if you see between 2012, gold 2007 to 2012, because the Chinese started liking gold a lot, it moved from 10 to 20, it moved from 10,000 to 33,000. Gold should generally be not more than 10 to 15% of your total investment. Always electronic investment is better than physical gold because physical gold has two risks. As Mirga Ghalib has very nicely said, Jab ghar mein sona baut hota hai, to raat ko neen nahi aati hai. And the second thing is that you can't, the other disadvantage about electronic gold is you can't convert electronic gold directly to physical gold. But as an investment, electronic gold is always better than physical gold because you don't have the risk of losing that gold. And secondly, you will not have a problem of worrying whether this is 24 carat, 22 carat or 12 carat or zero carat. You will get the market price of that mutual fund. Even the government sovereign bonds are good because they give you two and a half percent interest. And it's a good way to stay investment in gold. Generally, gold should be about 10 to 15 percent of your total investment. We come to the last investment, the most talked about and the least understood. And Warren Buffet has said something very great about the market. He says that the funny thing about the market is that at the same price and at the same time, one person buys and another person sells. And they both think they are smart. This is the world. This is the stock market index. So jam money, in my opinion, has to go to the markets. This is the world of bulls, bears, and don't get into the third category, the category of bakras. Shares which are frogs will always remain frogs. It's only in fairy tales that the, the, the princess kissed the frog and the frog became a handsome prince. It's the only market in the world which doesn't work on the fundamental principles of demand and supply. Demand and supply says when price falls, demand rises. Stock markets work on human emotions of greed and fear. The one number that is still important in this market, which is driven by liquidity today, is EPS. The allocation to equity should be jam money. Instead of 80 minus my age, I would prefer you to invest 90 minus your age into the stock market because there are certain unique India factors. I personally think that India is the best country in the world to be in for a youngster to be in because India's growth, this is the best part of the presentation I like. It's just two slides more. India's growth has never been below four and a half percent. The recovery is fastest in India. You need five M's for production machinery, men, materials, and markets, and money. And it is only money which can be digitalized. Everything else you need to be physically and this. There is a demographic dividend. 
from an aspirational population we are the youngest population in the world the other advantage is nowadays i don't think we are very much dependent on government policies because as a lot of people say the economy works at night when the government sleeps the english language professor sir david crystal of cambridge university has said something very nice about the english language when talking about india he says when 600 million people we have the maximum number of english speakers in the world when 600 million people speak a language in a particular way that will be the correct way to speak it and if we go back to history if we go back to the year 1750 if you read the history of india who hasn't looted india the british word, the english word loot was not there in the british dictionary before the british came to india if you read the history of india alexander kutubuddin abak mohammad gauri mohammad ghazni the dutch the french the portuguese the british who hasn't looted this country they say that the worst atrocities on mankind were what hitler's nazis did to the jews but ladies and gentlemen the nazis were there only for 15 years in eastern europe the british were here for 200 years so if you want to make money in the stock market i have one very simple philosophy obviously i can't give you the names of the shares but i believe in one very simple philosophy buy right and sit tight the problem is if you buy right you don't sit tight and if you buy wrong you sit tight there are companies which have given you that 20% return now remember 20% means what it means 72 divided by 20 which means your money should double every 3.6 years or 43 months and sometimes you make a little bit more of money i'll give you my last example there were two investors investor a and investor b in 1985 both of them had 10000 rupees investor a didn't believe in the stock market he invested in 8% government securities the money went up every 9 years it doubled 10 became 20 20 became 40 40 became 80 80 became 160 investor b bought 100 shares of this company and look at what is his value as of yesterday the last column is not the value of 10000 rupees it is the number of shares if you in 1985 bought 100 shares of wipro today you would be at valued at even after wipro has fallen by 35% you would have a nice tidy sum of 1024 crores 20 lakhs so people tell me balsara sahab ye kya 35 saal nikal gaye 85 to 2000 kuch aise fast batao na bhaiya stock market mein paisa fast nahi banta hai there's another company the company i spent 31 years sharma sahab was kind to introduce me the company lasan and tubro 100 shares became 4500 shares in 13 years the value of your investment went up 450 times if you took today's value of 2000 it's 90 lakhs your investment has gone up 500 times in 15 years so my last slide is the new seven golden rules do not spend more than you make or spend principal if you buy things you don't need you'll soon have to sell things that you need start early Remember Warren Buffett bought his first share at the age of 11 he owns 81 companies today saving and spending accounts be systematic and diversified money is not the most important thing in the world ladies and gentlemen it's always people first then money then things learn to enjoy money because you'll always find someone richer or someone poorer than you and the last thing i'm changing that first equation of finance from income minus expense to saving that was okay 20 years back today ladies and gentlemen it's not income minus expense is equal to saving it's income minus saving is equal to expense so as i told you this is a lifelong journey this is not the end it is not even the beginning of the end it is perhaps the end of the beginning thank you very much i have overshot the time by about 10 minutes but we still have about 10 minutes for questions and this is a commitment to you that lifelong i am available to you i'll pick up my own phone if i don't pick up i'm lecturing i'll definitely call you back and this is my email id it's been a pleasure talking to a distinguished audience like you thank you to mr sharma thank you to the audience and last and least thank you to andrela who organized this i'm doing this session from bma because there is still a power cut in my house so it's me, right so thank you very much and please stay in touch let me have your feedback and 
I would be happy if I have your feedback or your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, excuse you. me, sir. Yeah. Yeah, this is Yogendra Bhagat from Gale India Limited. Yeah, Yogendra. Uh, yeah, first of all, I must say that it was an excellent eye-opener presentation from a gentleman like you who has such a vast experience. Thank and you, many sir. things and many rules were like, though I have a little bit knowledge of finance, but still it was uh, great to listen to some of the rules that you have mentioned. My question is uh, that uh, right now with the PF getting taxed at over 2.5 lakh, so is it still uh, investment worthy? Because effective rate of interest would be hardly 6.3, which is yeah, but, as but, good as but inflation. Yeah, you know, yeah, I understand your yeah. question. Look at it this way, that what else yeah. are you getting, which is, see, last year PF gave you 8.10, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This year it is likely to, it at least won't be lower than 8.10. Maybe, right. So today, till you don't get anything which is giving you, which is equally safe, which is giving mm -hmm. you 8.10, I still believe it makes sense. Okay. If the minute your RBI bonds crosses 8.10 or say mm -hmm. a fixed deposit from a safe company, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. the safe companies is giving you more than 8.10, mm -hmm. a PF makes sense. Okay. Today, the PF okay. rates for senior citizens have moved to, today the, the fixed deposit rates for senior citizens have moved to about 7.75. Okay. For non-senior citizens, I think it is still about 7.25 or maybe 7.3. So remember, and right. I think it is very likely that PF will increase by 25 basis points to about 8.4. Okay. So it still okay. makes sense, you know. Right. So for me at the age of 40, if my 25,000 including employer's contribution is going in PF, so should I invest some more at the age of 40 or, or should I leave it by default? Yeah. Absolutely. Inc try to increase your VPF to about 40%. Okay. Okay. And I think okay. there are specific months of the year you can do it. If I'm not mistaken, it's April and October. Yeah, no, in Gale, we can do it anytime. We just okay. have to give a mail to HR. Do you have and they an will PF from or is it with the PF commissioner? No, no, we have our own trust of yeah, PF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with the PF authorities, with, uh, with, with most of the people don't have their exam PF, it's, it's usually in April and October. Okay, 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 sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, thank you very much, Mr. Vasara, for a very, very insightful and very, you know, uh, you know, a presentation which gives a very practical view. Uh, I mean, for the first time I have listened, such a vast presentation you have covered in, uh, you know, one hour, 20 minutes, uh, which is wonderful, which is wonderful. And uh, I'm sure everybody got um, uh, benefited with this. Um, I will request because we have another five minutes uh, if there are any questions, we are we welcome. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box, but uh, oh, so somebody is saying that for an NGO or a uh, charity box, the cha charity organization, what are the lucrative investment plans? The same, the same, sir. And uh, I think for a charity, you have to look at absolutely bread and butter investments. Okay. So the same RBI bonds, the same fixed deposits. And if you have got that exemption of income tax, you can go for a higher, like in our PF, we have an exemption rate. So you can go, the, the principles are not, but, but avoid jam investments, however tempting it might be, you know, because it's not your money, it's someone else's money. So the concept of jam is totally different, you know. Yes, yes. you can take risk with your money, but somebody else's you cannot. No, and you know, if you're young, you can take risk money, mm. but not for an organization, sir. Yeah, yeah. And so that's wonderful. And then I I had one, uh, you know, because though we know uh, some of these things, but still sometimes there are temptations which come in and person gets into it. How do we, you know, avoid those kind of things? Okay. Mm. Sir, I think the important thing is write down what you're spending. Yeah. Once you, once you know that, you really know what is bread and butter and what is jam. Hmm. And believe me, I mean, I didn't say this for want of time, but the last 45 years of my life, since the age of 16, the last thing I do at night, whichever part of the world I am in, I am right down in Indian currency how much I have spent. And you can fool around if you have jam money. I mean, it has to go to the stock market. And the other thing is that be, care, be very, very sure of how much you need. Because then the rest is jam, you know, and you can fool around with jam. So it's not really a temptation. Somebody asked me a question. Can the rules of NPS be explained again? Yes. The NPS rule was till the age of 60, you couldn't continue. Last year, they have given two very important things, which has equated NPS up to 5 lakhs to PPF. 
one they have said is that persons beyond 60 can open an nps account also you can continue to contribute up to the age of 70 and what is more interesting is that as long as your corpus is less than 5 lakhs you can withdraw the entire amount tax free so up to 5 lakhs so what you can do is every year contribute 50000 when it comes to 5 lakhs you can withdraw it which means it is exactly like exempt 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 and then after that open another nps account so that's that was a question, question from someone yes yes that's a good point um, okay a any other question anybody has any clarity because it was such a vast presentation and i am sure uh Mr. Salah, you will be sharing the presentation yeah, yeah, sure. the presentation that. and the owner of the presentation is lifelong available to you yeah. <laughs> or to your employees or anyone you want me to talk to that's so nice of you <laughs> Uh, so if I there have, are sorry yeah i have given my mobile and email id and i will answer it don't worry yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so kind of you and um, uh, so if there are no other questions then uh, i will uh, take the opportunity of uh, thanking you sir for uh, taking your time and pleasure, also sir. be very very humble and uh, the in a lucid manner in which you have presented the whole thing uh, I think it has. I have personally taken down a lot of notes uh, for my, uh, you know, takeaway and the takeaways which you had mentioned in the beginning of the uh, session have actually been, um, you know, delivered and we are very uh, thankful to you for spending time with us. Thank I look you, forward to you, to interacting with you uh, yes. post the session as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the participants. Please stay in touch. Thanks I'm so logging much. out, sir. Yeah.